Welcome to the course Stability Aspects of Structural Steel Design Concepts and Applications. We have come to the end of this course and this will be the last lecture for this course where we will be talking about the importance of steel structures. So the picture here shows you the increase in population in India. The x-axis shows the years starting from 1955 to 2050 and in the y-axis we see that the population is measured in millions. And in 1955 our population was 387 million and in 2020 it is 1.4 billion. It is projected that by 2050 we will reach 1.6 billion. Right? This is a huge increase in the population. So we have increased about five times in the last 100 years from 1955 to 2050. At the same time the degree of urbanization is also increasing. In 1955 the population who lived in the urban areas is about 18.6%. In 2020 it came to about 34.4%, whereas it is expected that 50% of our population will live in cities by 2050, which means that 800 million people will be living in cities in 2050. This puts a tremendous pressure on our urban infrastructure, so there is a need for land and public transportation facilities to be increased. So the land prices in urban areas are skyrocketing, and we cannot afford to have low-rise buildings. So the effective use of land can be accomplished by the high-rise buildings. The urban transportation facility should also be significantly improved and increased. Though this includes road bridges, metros, as well as rail bridges. All these are possible only if we select the right building material for the infrastructure. So what are the key requirements for selecting a building materials for the infrastructure? First and foremost is that it should be resilient towards natural disasters. What you see on the screen is the seismic map of India in 1970 on the left hand side and the seismic map of India in 2002 on the right hand side. You can see, as you can see that there are large white patches which belong to zone 1 which are very very less in seismic intensity and the seven sisters, the basically the northeastern part of our nation and some parts of Kashmir are basically having zone 5 which is red color as you can see on the left hand side. But after 30 years you can see the Indian seismic zone map on the right hand side which is on 2002 you can see that the zone 1 has been completely eradicated and it starts with zone 2 which is blue color and then goes up to zone 5. What is more interesting is that the code writers actually said this statement as you can see here. This 2002 seismic zone map is not the final word on the seismic hazard of the country and hence there can be no sense of complacency in this regard. And then what happened is now you can see that the latest seismic map of India in 2024, you can see that there has been a new zone that has been added, zone 6. That is, it starts with zone 2 which is yellow in color. You can see that there is an intense red that has been given for zone 6 which covers the northeastern states as well as a significant portions of Kashmir and some portions of the Kutch area. So these are all very very vulnerable for seismic activities and hence they have been designated to zone 6. Now while we worry about the seismic activities in India, there is also something that we need to be aware of which is the cyclone map of India. So what you see on the right hand side is the cyclone map of India. We have 7,500 kilometers of coastline covering 66 min prone districts starting from Kutch on the left hand side and comes all the way down to Kanyakumari and then goes up all the way to Kolkata. The highest wind speed in India is at two locations. One is at Mizoram, as you can see that is coded as rose color and also some parts of Kashmir which has a wind speed of 55 meter per second. So what is most interesting from these two maps is that at places where wind is not affecting, there is seismic that is controlling and where there is seismic is not affecting, wind is controlling. Because wind is basically controlling on the coastal regions whereas seismic activities are controlling interland as well. The next key requirement for selecting a building material is that it should promote sustainability in construction. A building material can be referred as sustainable only when it can unleash its native potential after demolition. So what you see is the 17 sustainable development goals given by UN. The aim is to have peace and prosperity for people and the planet while tackling climate change and working to preserve oceans and forests. So some of the things that are directly affected by the choice of building materials are good health and well-being and industry and innovation, sustainable cities and communities, Responsible consumption and production, 
climate change action. All these things are possible by selecting the right material for infrastructure. The next is to provide consistent quality in construction. Then promote faster and efficient construction. Offer flexibility for future expansion. These are some of the five key requirements for selecting a building material in the future. This leads to use of dry based construction methods such as steel construction that satisfies these requirements. So the way forward is to promote steel intensive construction. How can we accomplish that? We can accomplish that by providing a good code of practice for the use of steel in construction as well as by providing good technical manpower. So let's talk about the code of practice for use in steel construction. Why do we need a design code? Design codes majorly serve in protecting the structural engineer from disputes, stipulating the essential minimum requirements for the design and ensure adequate structural safety, guidance to designer in the design process by providing design aids such as charts, formulae, tables, flowcharts, etc., offering consistency among the designs. Well, how are design codes formed? We had a glimpse of the evolution of some of the design provisions in IS 800-2007. We have understood that the design equations in structural steel design codes are based on stability aspects. In this course, we have completed or covered a good amount of design of compression members. We have also studied about the design of members subjected to bending. And we also studied about the design of weight girders. These codes of practice are largely from the existing experimental database, numerical models trained using experimental results and analytical model using mechanics principles and mathematics. The existing experimental database is in some sense outdated because they have been carried out for low grade steel such as 250 MPA and this needs an updated research. So the need for research is to continuously update the design provisions and the database of test results to provide testing standards to conduct design assisted by testing and to address the limitations of codes for design problems by industry. We have to understand that code is a minimum requirement, but the real life problems may be much more complicated than that when it comes to the real world problems faced by the industry, which we need to have some kind of a mechanism which can also be design assisted by testing. What you see on the right hand side is the table one from IS 800, which shows the material properties of the steel. As you can see that IS 800-2007 allows a maximum yield stress of 450 MPa. Now the question is, are the design provisions applicable for high strength steel where the yield stress is greater than 450 MPa say? That's a question that we need to answer. Are the existing column buckling curves applicable to hot rolled and welded built up steel sections using high strength steel? Does the factor epsilon equal to root of 250 by FY accounts for high strength steel with yield stress greater than 450 MPa? The answer is a big no. Now let's look at the next one, which is the technical manpower. Technical manpower is required for erection and construction of steel structures. In the previous class, we have learned about the erection and placement of girders, which requires ensuring proper pickup points between third and quarter points, use girder clamps or girder docks, and spreader beams for controlled lifting. The picture here shows the lifting procedures using girder docks. You can also see the spreader beam as well as the girder docks and attach tag lines to each girder end to prevent twisting and rolling. Use one crane per girder to maintain stability until fully connected. Align and bolt the girders at splice locations before releasing crane support. These are all practical experiences that are required for a steel design erector to be understood. Install diaphragms between girders for added stability before proceeding with further girder placement. Basically, addition of a girder provides an added stability and it will prevent any kind of twisting, especially if it is a curved girder. Number two is the corrections and adjustments before concreting. Check alignment of girders and bolted connections for any misalignment. Inspect diaphragms and cross frames for proper placement and tightening. Verify elevation and camera of girders before proceeding to the deck slab construction. Ensure temporary bracing is in place to prevent lateral stability. Inspect shear connectors for correct positioning and full engagement with the steel structure. Now the third one is the pouring of concrete on the deck slab, which is an important activity and not many people understand the deck pour sequence. 
It is important to follow a systematic sequence for pouring concrete to avoid uneven load distribution. So you can see that there is a stage 1 is shown here where the deck pour sequence happens only at the support locations and it is shown by the red color concrete as you can see indicating it is a fresh concrete. So this is the intermediate beam and then you can also see at the bottom a CFS deck sheet and the length of the span is given here and at one third locations you pour the concrete to the right and left side of the intermediate beam. Now after sufficient curing you can move on to stage 2 where you can now see that the ones that have been marked in red color has been marked as black color which means that it has been sufficiently cured and the intermediate spaces can now be filled with concreting that is stage 2. Now you can see that the hardened concrete is marked here and in between the hardened concrete we are again pouring fresh concrete in stage 2. Avoid concrete pour within a single decking sheet span to prevent excessive deflections. Use suitable timber or plastic inserts for construction joints to prevent grout loss. Maintain proper curing procedures to avoid cracking and shrinkage related issues. The next one is the stability measures during concreting. Ensure balanced loading during pouring to prevent deck warping or instability. Limit concrete pouring height to knee level to reduce impact loading. The picture on the right hand side shows that the concrete should not be more than the knee level. Distribute the weight of concrete pump lines using suitable supports. This is because the concrete pump lines are very heavy and it needs to be properly distributed. Use spreaders to ensure an even finish while reducing excessive local loads. Monitor deck deflections and adjust pouring sequences if necessary. The deck deflections will give an indication if there is any concentrated load or excessive dead weight is happening at any one location. So then you can adjust the deck pouring sequences as necessary. So this all requires to have a trained manpower which can be accomplished by establishing a structural steel academy. So the steel construction techniques guidelines can be imparted to them, certificate programs for structural steel engineers can be issued, developing certified workers, welders, erectors and fabricators can also be taken care. So if you look at the usage of steel in construction, now today in India it is predominantly focused on pre-engineered building system as you can see here, basically it is a huge shed and at very selected locations where concrete is not possible to do the job especially in curved girders. The marked ones on the right hand side of the picture shows that it is a curved one basically and then the steel structure is used but the regular straight ones are all still done using concrete. And at very limited residential buildings as we can see here. So the usage of steel in construction today is comparatively very very low which is an alarming sign. Now, how do we overcome this? We can incentivize the real estate developers to move towards steel intensive construction. What we can do is to introduce a concept called steel usage index SUI to promote steel intensive construction. It is an indicator of the amount of steel required to construct a superstructure which includes both structural and non-structural elements. It is measured in terms of structural steel usage per square feet. Tax incentives for developers can be provided when the minimum threshold is exceeded. A tax slab can also be introduced for higher SUI. A tax benefit slab may also be provided for real estate developers as shown below. Here we have divided into three categories. One is low and next one is medium and next one is high. The minimum steel usage index as well as the maximum steel usage index is given. So when the steel usage index is between 4.5 kg per SFT to 5.5 kg per square feet, it can be considered as low. When it is between 5.5 and 6.5, it can be considered as medium. And when it is from 6.5, greater than 6.5, it can be considered as high SUI, which is high steel usage index. Accordingly, the tax incentives can be provided to the real estate developers. In addition, providing a 0.5% of reduction in interest on housing loads by banks can significantly promote usage of steel in residential constructions. Because mostly Indian consumers are price sensitive, a half a percent reduction provided by the nationalized banks or any other bank can significantly alter the decision making of the common individuals and it can promote steel intensive construction which will also be 
a great boost for the nation to reach an higher GDP. With this one, I would like to thank you so much for being so patient with me for all these 12 weeks. And I have shared most of my knowledge that I've gained over several years for bridging the gap between structural steel design as well as stability. I hope this will be a good course for you to go through and understand the intricacies of steel design in the coming years. Thank you very much. Jai Hind.